Uh, let me offer my thanks to the hosts of this exciting conference as well, uh, and the wonderful array of speakers talking about new strategies. I'm Karen Nussbaum, the Director of Working America, the community affiliate of the AFL-CIO. Um, and to acknowledge, first off, that a lot of the most exciting new strategies are coming directly out of the traditional labor movement, uh, from AFT, UFCW, SEIU, UA, uh, uh, UAW, CWA, Steelworkers, and that's just the beginning. Um, there's a breadth of experience we're going to hear from today, uh, but I wanted to just tell you a little bit about my experience, where I've come from. Uh, I'm, from I'm one of the early adopters of the notion that you build movement and institution at the same time. Uh, we, I was part of starting 9 to 5, the Organization for Women Office Workers, uh, a million years ago or so. Um, and we were incredibly successful at, uh, we engaged tens of thousands of women who'd never been involved in anything before, and we touched millions. Uh, and for institutional power, while we were, had this open facing, anyone can join organization 9 to 5, we also created institutional power in a union, District 9 to 5, uh, which was part of SEIU. Now, our timing was perfect on the movement building side. We complete with getting our own major motion picture, 9 to 5, and the timeless workers anthem, the 9 to 5 song by Dolly Parton. Um, but unfortunately, the timing was a little off on the institution building side. We started our union in 1975, completely concurrent with the uh, newest form of union busting that was just emerging. And we were a really big cost center for a lot of those union busters. Um, but nonetheless, we have built a union that uh, prevails today uh, and understands uh, both the challenges but the power of collective bargaining. Working America, as I said, the community affiliate of the FLCIO, is, uh, I sometimes think of it as nine to five with men and resources. Um, it is also an open door to all, to any worker who doesn't have a union, uh, it's an open, uh, an open door to enter the labor movement to be part of what we're doing to fight to, uh, for good jobs and a just economy. Uh, but it's the only door in some ways, certainly the only door on scale, uh, for a part of the working class that really doesn't otherwise get touched by the progressive movement, and that's white working class, uh, particularly moderates, out there in suburbs particularly who are easily peeled off by right-wing social agenda and increasingly by libertarianism. Uh, but who would be with us if we went and found them. And certainly that's the experience of Working America, which today has more than three million members, largely those white working class moderates, all of whom don't have a union on the job. Um, we're, we're successful around politics and policy and being uh, strong in our community, and now we're turning that capacity, that institutional capital, let's say, to uh, the dilemma and the challenge of creating new forms of worker representation and organizing. We're doing that a lot, and I just want to outline a little bit about what we're doing. Uh, we're doing that a lot with affiliates, so we use our field capacity, our ability to go out into the field every single night and talk to folks um, in, in partnership with AFSME around their really exciting campaign to organize, uh, reorganize the organized among their home health care workers. Uh, with UFCW around uh, uh, our Walmart, when we go door to door in neighborhoods, we encounter lots of retail workers, including, as it turns out, in, depending on the community, hundreds over the course of a month or so, who are former and current uh, Walmart associates or uh, other kinds of retail workers. Um, we recently worked with the local labor movement in Ames, Iowa, to knock on uh, every door in a big part of Ames and find out where everybody works. Well, that's a pretty awesome uh, wealth of information that's really hard to come by in other ways. And we're an incubator uh, for unions as they try new forms of organizing, like the Iron Workers, which created the Iron Workers Associates, which is a 
pardon me, a committee of Working America, uh, and they've used it as a way to reach out to un unorganized iron workers, help them take militant action on the job, uh, and then uh, raise standards in those uh, uh, workplaces and then move them into standard membership. But we're also a laboratory for change for other kinds of strategies. And as we, uh, we're trying now to find what are the sustainable forms of organizing, whether it's among licensed workers, whether it's among uh, big groups of workers like retail outside of uh, big workplaces, uh, or citywide formations that encompass all kinds of workers uh, to build dues, uh, organizations with dues paying members who have a vote. Uh, and as we look at building those organizations, we also have three concerns, and they're a little bit different than David's, and that's what makes for a good discussion, I think. And so what we're looking at is the, the, the key challenges for us is, first of all, the importance of changing minds. Uh, that the issue fights that, we, that we're having today on minimum wage or paid sick days are uh, necessary, they're thrilling, they're creating tremendous momentum. Uh, but they don't necessarily change your world view. Uh, and I certainly saw that when I was out campaigning in DuPage County, right outside of Chicago, going door to door in this recent election, where at every door I knocked, everyone was for uh, in raising the minimum wage while they were also saying that they were going to vote for Bruce Rauner, who was probably the most anti-worker candidate uh, in this last election cycle, who did become governor of, pardon me, of Illinois. I'm going to get a glass of water. Um, uh, thank you very much. So we need those fights for all the reasons I mentioned, but we also need to create a, a viewpoint uh, so that we're not going back and fighting over the same the issue fight over and over and over again, a viewpoint that basically says that Wall Street and big corporations fundamentally have different interests than working people, and that the way you, uh, and that it's the strength and numbers of working people that are the countervailing force, the only, in some ways, countervailing force to that kind of power. Now, pollsters call that a frame. I think in the olden days we might have called that class consciousness. But that's what workers need to have in order to, so that when they wake up every morning, that's what they bring to what they're reading in the newspaper or hearing on the news or experiencing on the job. Uh, that, uh, and so that changing minds, creating that, I think is essential to building the kind of sustained new forms of organizing that we're talking about. Secondly, uh, structure and scale. Um, uh, and uh, David and I certainly agree on, on a lot of this. Uh, and I won't belabor it. Uh, we've, many of us have talked here about the change from trade unions to uh, industrial unions in the 30s. And I know as a young organizer at SEIU, we, were, we organized wall to wall, that the importance was don't just organize those clerical workers, organize everybody in the workplace. And that's the way we'll have the greatest power. But, as the workforce has changed um, uh, and we find people with you know, huge turnovers in these workplaces and you work not for the direct employer, but you know, it's yeah, welcome, precariat, uh, that we need to change the model. And in fact, today we may have more to learn from trade union organizing than we do from industrial organizations. Uh, and there's a lot more to say about that, and I won't right now in the interest of time. Um, but that it also, uh, as we do that, we have to look at how we're going to bring that to scale, which starts with militants taking militant action, but has to be supported by other dues-paying supporters. And that leads me to my last point, and that is the importance of dues and democracy. Uh, that we need revenue, but a lot, but it has to be, I believe, conscious decisions to pay dues to support your organization because it's your organization. Uh, workers need to pay for their own organizations uh, and uh, for a variety of reasons, including my first point, which is consciousness, um, but they also have to have a vote. 
Uh, and that uh, democracy can be a hot mess, right? And it doesn't always get you where you want to go, but that's a challenge that we've got to take on. Uh, we have to build a workers' movement um, and that, uh, that redistributes wealth and power. That our object here is not just to redistribute wealth, but to redistribute wealth and power. Uh, and the only way we do that, I believe, is if workers own their organizations through their dues and their vote. Uh, one last word, and that is whether the new forms and old forms are in conflict. Um, collective bargaining unions are investing millions of dollars and uh, uh, time and strategy into new forms um, as, as they and we should. Uh, and as others, uh, including Randy this morning, talked about 100 years ago, the AFL, the trade unions, the, and the, um, the uh, organization of those trade unions was in peril. Uh, the CIO and industrial organizing wasn't a threat to trade unions, even though it probably felt like it was. In fact, the uh, success of the C CIO was the salvation of trade unions. Uh, union, because of the adapting to a new form of the workplace and the workforce, union membership skyrocketed and it was the increase in union density and the success of a workers' movement that then uh, created the, the uh, undergirding of the trade union form of organizing as well as new industrial organizing so that collective bargaining as a whole uh, uh, thrived. Uh, the new forms of representation we are experimenting with today don't deliver the power of collective bargaining, uh, but they may be the only way to both uh, redistribute wealth and power and preserve the power of collective bargaining unions uh, as we go into the future. Thank you.